Hello and welcome to the Superhero Show. I am Chris Tilley and this week Daniel Kruper is in his superhero alter ego, which is editor-in-chief of IGN, Alex Simmons. The, the alter ego where I'm actually more powerful <laughs> as the normal me than I am as a superhero. Bit older. Bit older. Taller. That is true. Smarter. Uh, wiser. Wiser. That's well, we'll, my superpower. We'll see on this week's show how wise see. you are, because yes. uh, this week we're going to be talking about TV shows, superhero shows and TV. Um, Alex, you watch a lot of them. Uh, I try to. That's yeah. my kind of advice, I guess, is that, you know, just trying to... Get, well, there are so many, yeah. so trying to keep up with them, but obviously highlights recently, Daredevil, Arrow is coming to its conclusion, Flash almost at the end, but yeah, yeah I watch pretty much everything. Yeah, and so this week we're going to talk about who's doing better, DC or Marvel, but we're going to kick off because there's been a couple of uh, trailer debuts this week with an email from Ryan Pollard who says, Hi guys, I know you guys don't do much TV on the Superhero Show, not this week, Ryan, yeah. uh, but what did you think of the new Supergirl trailer? After having already been a bit apprehensive about the Supergirl project in general, I'll admit, I'm actually more than intrigued. I still hate the idea of Jimmy Olsen changing from skinny geek photographer to alpha male football player photographer, but the look and tone feels right. Melissa Benoit will no doubt create an iconic Supergirl, and I'm happy that they are keeping Supergirl faithful to the comics and, do, and not doing an incredibly dark, miserableist approach like in Man of Steel. So, uh, what do you think of the six-minute promo? Yeah, well, hey, six minutes, come on, that's pretty much the entire pilot. But I think, firstly, it's not aimed... At me. Yeah. And, you know, I, if I look beyond that, I think it's got potential. Because one of the things I really like about Flash is that it, it's very lighthearted. It doesn't take itself seriously uh, compared to something like Arrow. Uh, in fact, when uh, the Atom is an Arrow, uh, I really like the fact that the comedy relief that he brings to that. Mm. Um, I'm just not sure I could stomach an entire season of it is the entire thing. Because obviously the, the comparisons we drew were... It's kind of Supergirl crossed with um, Devil Wears Prada. Devil Wears Prada, clue, Clueless. I yeah. guess, yeah, we were kind of turned off by the fashion, you know, girl in the big city trying to make yeah. it. Whereas that maybe that is a real interest to, you know, certain portions of the audience out there who yeah. maybe aren't into the dark Daredevil stuff. And But I guess it depends how much of that is going to take up the entire season because, you know, all of that could have been taken from the pilot. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we see her exploring her powers and becoming more confident as Supergirl as the show goes on. And, and, and maybe that's not the whole thing. No. It's, it's just that was the, the vibe I got. Yeah, and the Callista Flockhart stuff was yeah. make, made me cringe a little bit. Yeah. But agree, when it got to the superhero stuff, like, Smallville took such a long time to get to him. Uh, and the point that was the point, that he wasn't really going to wear it till the end. Yeah. But it was great to see her in the costume doing real... Like, it was quite looked quite spectacular as yeah. well. It just shows how far... Uh, effects have come that TV's now doing stuff like that on, yeah. on all these TV shows actually yeah. and obviously you've got the money shot at the end where you've got the passing over of uh, the cape which happened to be <laughs> Superman's kind of baby blanket yeah um, he couldn't be bothered to come visit her <laughs> no. even though his cousin was on earth with him but yeah. he, sent her, he sent her a blanket one of the things that I really hope is that they do crossovers and they do them well because yeah. I think Flash and Arrow have done them really well you can watch the episodes Separately, but together they work really, well, really, really well. Didn't work so well for Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., at least in the first season, because it felt like the first season of that was hamstrung by the crossover. Yeah. Uh, sec second season with the Ultron stuff was a bit better. Yeah. So... Well, uh, I'm going to get onto the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff, but obviously we've, we had Supergirl, but we also had a Legends of Tomorrow trailer, which yeah. is something that got us much more excited, didn't it? Well, it's kind of all of the shows that I've been watching recently thrown into one and with extra kind of superheroes um, kind of added for measure. And I think the reason I like it is you look at something like the DC Cinematic Universe and what they're doing with um, Batman versus Super, uh, Superman and, of course, Suicide Squad. That's not really kind of clicking for me. Whereas this, I watched the trailer and I was like, I am well up for that. Yeah. Even though it's a lot of the kind of smaller tier characters, I think that probably works to its advantage because yeah. they've got more flexibility and freedom to have fun with them. Yeah. Well, I'm a sucker for time travel anyway. Yeah. But, I mean, the one thing about that trailer is that it was... We don't know if any of that's actually going to appear in the show because apparently a lot of it was shot for the promo. Yeah. But some of it looked quite big budget. Like, I'd be amazed yeah, if some yeah, of the yeah. battles at the end yeah. weren't in it. Yeah. But, yeah, that you agreed the stuff with the Atom and... The, and, and um, but there are so many question marks over... And, again, trying to avoid spoilers for anyone who hasn't caught up with the latest Flash and uh, Arrow stuff is that maybe time travel is a big part of this. Yeah. Because there is story arcs going on within those series mm. that don't really lend itself to that trailer. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how they kind of explain that. Yeah. Well, I guess in comics, like if you're talking about death, 
characters are never blooming dead true. in comics, are well, they? That's, so. and, it, and hopefully this isn't too much of a spoiler, but Black Canary, who we see as White Canary, yeah. um, obviously something happens there. And there is an explanation within the trailer for that. Watch the Rewind Theatre on IGN to kind of figure out what's going yeah. on there. But it's, yeah... Uh, in fact, that's one of my biggest problems with Arrow. I wish there was a little bit more commitment to, do you know what? That person should have died. Yeah. And a lot of the time there is this really kind of pathetic way that they're not really, they're coming well, back. Well, I feel like you can do that once. Yeah. But to, to keep doing it is just a bit disingenuous and the, yeah. it means you lose the trust of the audience a little bit. Yeah. And that was the big thing for Arrow season three, was Black Canary and the transformation there and what happened with her. Yeah. Uh, and there were a few things that happened near the end of um, that season, but it doesn't quite have the same commitment. Mm. But even that big story decision looks like that's been turned around from the Legends of Tomorrow trailer. Yeah, oh, it'd be intriguing to see. I don't think that one's till next year, yeah. but I believe we're they've getting not, Supergirl before the end of this year. They've so. not actually even started shooting. No. Uh, yeah, so it was obviously everything was for that trailer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which cool. I loved. Yeah, it was a great trailer. Yeah. So let's talk about Marvel and DC. Uh, let's go through the list. So Marvel on TV right now have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, uh, Powers and Daredevil. Yep. Uh, DC have Arrow, The Flash, Constantine, although that was just cancelled, and Gotham. Yeah. And then we've got coming up from Marvel, we've got Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist and The Defenders. Yep. And season two of Daredevil. And uh, DC, you've got Supergirl, Legend of Tomorrow and... Preacher. Yeah. Interestingly, overnight, um, Seth Rogen tweeted the first picture that. from the Preacher set, which has got me yeah. excited. Yeah. I mean, I'm, not, I'm excited about that because it's a very different style of show, of, of comic, and those guys bring their own kind of stuff. But that's kind of separate to these ones. Let's, let's talk about the superhero ones. So, yeah. how do you, you know, overall, which ones are you watching or which ones are you, are you kind of, has become kind of must-see TV for you? Firstly, I would say both, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Yep. Um... In, on the DC side, I started with Gotham, but I found it really hard going. Yeah. And um, being a Batman fan, I was really hoping for something special. With yeah. That. But it's just the storylines weren't great. The acting wasn't great. The characters, it did, nothing really kind of gelled. Yeah. And at the opposite end of the scale, I think you've got Arrow and more recently Flash. Um, because Arrow has always been my favourite, mm. certainly the first two seasons. But... Like it's a really cheesy thing to say, but Flash has hit its stride. Yep. See what I did there? Yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's kind of pulling ahead, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, he'll be first past the post. Yeah. Anyway, let's stop that. But yep. I just think it, it comes back to the whole point of um, Arrow really hit stride at the end of season two because it was f fulfilling the story arcs that it wanted to. Yeah. With season three, it felt like it had to kind of do something bigger. And in some areas it succeeds and in others it doesn't. So it's... In, surprisingly it's the highest uh, rated season on Rotten Tomatoes it's 100% I completely disagree with that yeah because it has fantastic episodes and it has some slightly shaky ones yeah um, and if you look at Marvel's slate if it wasn't for Daredevil I'd be a bit lukewarm on that because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. first season was okay but yeah. like I said before I think there was too much reliance on what was going on with Captain America 2 and it was it kind of felt that that was Cap 2 was there and that was kind of coexisting alongside and supporting that yeah it feels like they're the, the le less interesting younger yes. brother that you don't really want hanging around yeah. all the time constantly looking up to the, the big brother to, for, for kind of guidance and what to do yeah and so I think it's a blessing and a curse that they do more of the crossovers yeah. from movie to TV in that it's really fun when someone shows up or it, or it gets acknowledged and you feel like you're part of this larger world when you kind of if you're keeping track of everything yeah but equally, uh, it does, I, th I think you're right, it does kind of tie their hands a bit. And also, it makes for these weird inconsistencies. Like, we, we've talked about this before, but when I interviewed Joss Whedon, he was saying that Agent Coulson is definitely dead in the movies, but definitely alive in the TV show. And yet, they're not separate. Yeah. And so, that's, com that's completely confusing. Yeah. Nick Fury can pop up in both, but Agent Coulson now can't, because it, it's just like... I don't know, it feels like they're making up as they go along a lot more than they are with their the, the, just their movie yeah. universe. Yeah, well, especially because they spent pretty much the entire first season explaining how Agent Coulson wasn't dead. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, he is actually, again, in the second yeah. movie. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, yeah, that comes back to the points that I was making about how I think, you know, the crossovers that happened in the DC universe were a lot more subtle and they work, but they're not necessarily the kind of be-all and end-all. Mm. Uh, and, you know, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 2 um, 
did that better. But, you know, it's got more confidence. But for me, you know, the, obviously the, the strongest one in the whole of the Marvel lineup is Daredevil. Yeah. Um, it's, I think pretty much everybody here binge watched that show. Yeah. Um, and I think that was one of the kind of things that I loved about it is that, you know, I've been watching Arrow for the best part of uh, an entire, oh, sorry, half a year. Mm. And it's kind of, you know, it takes a long time to gain that momentum. Whereas when uh, Daredevil, I watched the entire thing in a, in a week, which... Do you I think liked. that gives a show bigger, a better impact? I think it allows you to kind of follow the story more closely. I, I have the same problem is that I've got three or four shows that I'm watching on a weekly basis. And it kind of blurs the lines. Mm. Obviously, not Game of Thrones doesn't kind of <laughs> blend into that. Yeah. But it does get a little bit confusing. And, and I tend to get sometimes superhero fatigue. Yeah. Uh, but I never did with uh, Daredevil because you kind of finish an episode and you're like, I want to see the next one. Yeah. And there was no wait. And I love that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really interested to see what they do with season two. And hopefully they can maintain that kind of momentum. Yeah. There's still an element of them looking to the movies, though. And I think this is an advantage that DC have by keeping them so separate. They can introduce whatever characters they want, when they want. They don't have to worry about... You know, if you if you think about the three seasons of Arrow, all the villains and heroes they've introduced, yeah. and they don't have to worry about that. They yeah. can just do what they want, when they want. I think that's really helpful to them. Yeah. Um, like, it'll be interesting to see if they do introduce Superman to Supergirl, and, you know, they keep it separate. It's not Henry Cavill, yeah. it's a new Superman. Yeah. I think that'll be interesting. They sit, For me, DC as well, they seem to have found a real consistent style and tone that they're carrying across the shows where it can be fun. You can have a fun week or, or a serious week and it doesn't great. It doesn't feel like they're yeah. trying too hard. Yeah. And I think that's the, you know, in a universe that exists like, you know, dark side, arrow, light side, flash. Yeah. But they gel together really nicely. Yeah. And so I'm interested to see how Supergirl fits within that. Yeah. Um, because or, or if indeed she will or they keep her separate. Yeah. But. But, but I don't mind the fact that there are shows that aren't always aimed at me but sit within the same universe. Yeah. I think that's quite a nice thing. You know, yeah. I'd love, for example, she's a bit young, but you know, further down the line for my daughter to be into kind of Supergirl and I can understand why she likes that and yeah. I watch the stuff that I do. Yeah, it feels like on TV, DC are creating, and it's Greg Valanti who's overseeing the whole thing, yeah. is creating a shared universe as strong as what Marvel have done uh, on in the movies. Yeah. Kevin Feige has done, but not not necessarily trying to cross that with TV. Yeah, yeah. So it's the one kind of place where maybe DC is winning, I think. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. For me, I kind of look at it. I think there's a good analogy between the movies and the TV in that I feel like Marvel are making really fun movies and they're winning that battle. Yeah. But then again, the greatest movie is DC's very serious Dark Knight yeah. trilogy. And yet, it's the other way around. Whereas on TV, DC are making the fun best TV shows. And yet, the actual best TV show is the very serious Marvel Daredevil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's an That's, interesting... Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. 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 Yeah, certainly for me, I think. And it's very... It, it's too early to write off DC in terms of, you know, the cinematic universe. Because we've only seen teasers of what's to come. But certainly, I think... For me, Marvel is dominating in that field. But like you say, you know, DC is doing amazing things on TV and I cannot wait for Legends of Tomorrow. So if you had to pick one, who is winning, who is winning the battle right now? Right now, week? I'm going to go DC. Yep, I'm agreeing. I'm saying DC as well. But it'd be interesting to revisit in a year when we've uh, seen maybe AK Jessica Jones, yep. season two of Daredevil, yep. uh, a preacher. I mean, the, the landscape could be totally yep. different. Like, whichever way you go, you know, it's an amazing time for superhero television. Yeah, yeah. exciting times. There you go, something pro-DC. <laughs> we did it. Uh, right, we've obviously had a couple of shows on Age of Ultron, so we wanted to avoid it this week, but again, we've had an avalanche of emails about it. Yeah. So we're going to kick off with some kind of questions that we had last week, uh, or things that we got wrong. Uh, we were asking about this mysterious girl in the pool in the dream sequence in Age of Ultron and why she was in the trailer but not the movie. A lot of you emailed about that. I'm... Uh, picking Ben Eismers, who said, um, Joss Whedon said that his original cut, which was over three hours long, included a huge portion on how Thor and Skarsgar get to the pool and explaining its purpose, etc., and was far less quick and confusing than the final cut showed. Unfortunately, it was the Marvel Studio execs that forced him to cut the film down and turn it into a slightly crappy setup for Ragnarok. So, Ragnarok, sorry. So, yeah, so that's the reason that that girl was in the trailer and not the movie, as we kind of thought. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Email from Fraser McDay that says, I just wrote in to say 
Uh, you mentioned Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet in the Stinger of Age of Ultron and how he managed to get it from Asgard, but that isn't true. The Gauntlet on Asgard is left-handed, but the one Thanos takes is right-handed, or vice versa, I can't remember. Kevin Feige has gone on to confirm that they're not the same, and there are, in fact, two Gauntlets. Of course there are. <sighs> so, yeah, I, we, again, we had a lot of emails about that, so thanks to everyone who pointed that out, the fact that we didn't notice that one was left-handed, one was right-handed. Why don't you notice that, Chris? <laughs> Come on. Um, oh, two Gauntlets. Brilliant. How many hands have you got? Oh, so it's just like if. Oh, so will that set up phase fourteen of the second gauntlet? That's, I hope so. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, okay, I have an email here from Nico um, Inghilterra. Sorry if I said that name wrong. Uh, just saw your most recent video about Age of Ultron and the end bit about the Hulk operating the jet. Yeah, I wasn't happy about Hulk operating jet. Uh, I have a theory that since it was released uh, that they planned to have the Grey Hulk in this film originally and take into account that the Grey Hulk is generally a more banner controlled Hulk I believe they are seeding this character to be a more articulate hero for later movies rather than the unpredictable destructive monster so far portrayed. Uh, I agree. I think it is probably, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But also, just fitting him inside a cockpit. <laughs> Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't work. Uh, also, when I first watched the scene of him in the jet, I was hoping for him to fly into space, thereby hinting at Planet Hulk's storyline, which would allow him to be absent in the upcoming Civil War. What do you think? I thought exactly the same thing, and maybe that is something they were alluding to, or just him getting him out of the picture for Civil War, yeah. uh, should he not appear yep. at all. Alex Slater writes in saying, After watching Daredevil and Age of Ultron, I had a thought. Do you think that Daredevil will, one, uh, will be the one to start Civil War? As the moment, he is the only hero in the universe that we know of to have a secret identity. And with his brutality, he could kill a lesser-known politician or other person of power that could be working for Hydra or another or evil organisation. This could then bring the Superhero Registration Act and be a good way to link it all together. I think that is a very good idea. I fully agree, and I don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen. You know, sometimes when we interview these guys and they kind of dance around a subject or we ask them a question and, like, Benedict Cumberbatch, when we asked him if he was Doctor Strange, he yep. gave that very funny uh, reaction. When I asked um, Charlie Cox about this, you could tell he wasn't BSing. Like, he hasn't had the phone call. He's not in it. You know, he was saying, I don't know, I think they should start shooting this week. I'd, he was saying, I'd love to be in it. Yeah. Uh, he said, I could even do just a day, like a cameo. But he oh, said, I hope. Him. Yeah, he said, I hope someone <laughs> on the film is watching the TV show and likes it so much they give me a ring. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't think how it works. No. But um, but you could tell that at that point he wasn't. That's not to say he won't appear in it. But by now he won't play that larger role. No. I think a much better uh, idea is the one that was emailed in last week or the week before. The suggestion that maybe Scarlet Witch is the one that her powers she lose control of them after what's happened with her brother in this film, and she's the one that might do you know whatever her actions sort of the catalyst yes yep. like the touch paper yes uh is it, are we back on to me yes ever michael emails in saying uh just want to know what you think about uh this potential idea for the mcu with actors getting older how do you feel about the mcu doing sort of the bond thing and seamlessly replacing actors to play a character but keep the story in the same timeline i understand that no one can replace downey as iron man for instance but i think it's an interesting idea I do as well. Like, do you necessarily have to have, you know, Iron Man Mark II or re being replaced by other characters? Could you not just replace the actor? That, they are some serious boots to fill there. Sure. Like... Sometimes Cuban heels. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it looks to me when, when you've... But, you know, it's obviously it's not just, you know, Downey Jr. It's, all of those are icons yeah. brought together in the Avengers. I'm not sure that you could... Well, you couldn't just replace one of those characters for, and all, for all the rest to be there. Just wouldn't... It would feel weird. Well, they've actually done it because uh, Don Cheadle replaced Terence Howard between in Iron Man. I film. guess so. So they've done it, and he has gone on to become a, a more major... not the same as... No, sure, not as what big. What we're talking about. Not as big. I agree, it would be weird. I think it's different horses for different courses. I mean... It could work, but at the moment it doesn't look like that's how no. they do it. It'll be interesting to see what they do do with Iron Man, how yeah. they retire that character or replace him. Yeah, but because for me, Downey Jr. is Tony Stark. He yeah. is Iron Man. Yeah. Uh, in the same way that Christian Bale was Batman for a long time, and I would have hated to have seen a Nolan universe where that didn't continue. Mm. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see what Zack Schneider is doing it with Batman Superman, but mm. I don't know. I think that's a tall order. Yeah. And, and for me, I think it would be better trying to start fresh yep 
Angel Castillo writes in saying, Days of Future Past, Captain 2, Guardians and Daredevil raised superhero quality to a whole new level over the past year. I like Age of Ultron, but it didn't exceed any of those movies to me. I completely agree. Yeah, I, I, I put that email in because I hadn't thought of it in those terms. And I was like, actually, much as I liked Age of Ultron, I don't yeah. know if I liked it as much as those ones. Yeah. It's always tough. Like you you got to instant react to a film and it's such a spectacle. But then I think you can only really sort of judge it a year or two down the line, whether, you know, when it's coming on the telly, do yeah. you want to watch it again? or? Yeah. And I would sooner watch those movies, I think, than yeah. Age of Ultron again. And I think the point is, it's not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. It just, for me, didn't capture uh, me in the same way that, well, any of those, and obviously the first Avengers did. Yeah. Uh, Adam Harris writes in and says, Hey guys, just want to know how you'd all feel if they brought back Blade into the MCU. I personally love the character and Wesley Snipes' portrayal of him. And with the Doctor Strange announcement, I think it would be an awesome time to bring in more supernatural mystic characters to the mix. Besides, the first Blade movie was the catalyst for the rest of the MCU, and it's a shame that he isn't in it. I would love to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts, Alex Simmons? Well, I love Blade. I really like Blade, and um, especially Blade 2. That's probably my favourite out of all of them. Yeah. And the world it was set in and the way that the characters were portrayed, obviously, I don't think you could have Snipes doing it anymore. No, I don't <laughs> think so. His post-prison body yeah. isn't the same. No. But, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, because, God, how long ago was Blade now? That's 10, 15, 15 years. years. Yeah, you know, yeah. A long time. So yeah. I'm well up for resurrecting that character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think there's plenty of scope. It's just a shame that Bross can't be back in it. Obviously, uh, Luke Goss was... Luke was Goss. it Luke or Matt? I can no, never Luke. remember. Luke's, Luke's the actor. Yeah. He's quite good, though. It was great. Mocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm being serious. Yeah, no, not so am I. <laughs> Bring back Blade. Yes. Uh, Graham from Grangemouth here uh, got to say what's the deal with the suicide pictures man every single day um, they look like they're in a rubbish music video <laughs> the Joker looks like uh, Marilyn Manson Will Smith looks like Michael Jackson uh, all he needs is the white glove Harley Quinn an 80s pop star and there are a few punks in there that don't look menacing at all yeah so I guess I guess as usual like the Suicide Squad picture arrived after we'd done a show uh, the, the cast picture so we didn't get to talk about it I kind of agreed with that though like that's why I put that in yeah like, but I think obviously the, the main picture came out with all of them mm. in it and then since then I think pretty much every day we've had set photos of Harley Quinn showing with water her, on it <laughs> yes, like wearing tight shorts and it raining so, oh my goodness uh, and Will Smith looking like nonchalant yeah. <laughs> not really bothered what's going on that's why I'm finding it hard to be excited for that film. Yeah, but maybe, you know, a different look to what's gone before, something new. Uh, he makes good, tough movies, that director, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not got me chomping at the bit as no. such. No. Uh, but let's not end on a DC downer. No. Ryan Carroll says, You know by now the casting of the next Spider-Man uh, is down to two young actors, namely Asa Butterfield and Tom Holland. Did it come out as Asa Butterfield last okay, night? Yeah, I think it's looking like it is Asa Butterfield. I thought it did, yeah. Yep. Uh, I haven't seen much of either actor, but my personal choice would be Butterfield. His charm and subtle intensity in Ender's Game left an immediate impression on me, and sometimes you see an actor perform in a specific role and you automatically say to yourself, that guy or girl would make an excellent superhero character. Yeah. You're I good? agree. Yeah, he's a really good actor. He's the kid in Hugo and in Ender's Game. Who does he play in Ender's Game? Ender. Oh, he plays that yeah, kid, yeah. right? He's the gotcha. lead kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He's, he's a really likable presence on screen, uh, and he can really act as well. Right. Uh, I haven't really seen him be funny, which is that you know if it's going to be high school Spider Man, I think we're going to have a yeah. funny. He's going to be kind of a bit of comic relief in the movie, but um, he's a really lovely lad as well. I've met him a couple of times at Comic Con actually. Right. Really nice. He's a Brit. And as all super good superheroes are yes. played by Brits. Um, and he's a real gamer as well. He's a big gamer. Okay. So let's reach out to him now, get him in to play some games. and Play Spider-Man. Yeah. It hasn't been a good Spider-Man game for ages. No. Oh, well. But um, yeah, I think, he's, I think he's really good. Have you seen Ender's Game? I have, yes. Yeah, and he's, what did you think of him? I thought it was, uh, the overall film was... Mm, mm. But yeah, he was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's a big step, going from that to Spider-Man. Yeah. That's a hell of a you know, transformation. But, you know, let's see. Like you say, you know, Spider-Man's got to be cocky. He's got to be... Um, Wise cracking, confident. funny. Yeah, exactly. And he's got to have to go toe-to-toe with Danny Jr. and yeah. Chris Evans and all these people in the yeah. movie. So, which is what we always say. When anyone's comes these films, like, man, it is tough to go, go and be on screen with those guys. But yeah, 
We'll see. So let us know what you think about that casting or anything else we've talked about in the show. Uh, the address is superhero at ign.com. Uh, next week, will you be returning returning to your Crooper esque form? I'm going to go back to my secret lair and let uh, the young upstart come back. Excellent. All right. Well, yes. thank you for watching as ever, and keep it tuned to IGN for all your superhero needs. <laughs>